everyone for coming, and obviously thanks to Louise for coming. I'm hoping that you've all got a lot of questions. Because I, even though we've, we've run the site for quite a few years, yeah. this is only the second guest we've had. You know, about five years ago we had Annika Wills come down for um, while she was putting her autobiography. She came down, there's about 20 to 30 people. There's quite a few people in the room that were here for that one. But the majority of people in the room I've never seen before. So hopefully we can start coming to more events. Um, I'm not used to doing it. Uh, I do all the organising, but most of my wife um, gets me to do all the extra bits that we get. And that's why uh, most of you will have seen her helping me to get the uh, DVD player up because it just wasn't happening. But eventually, by five, five, ten past twelve, we got three really in the way. Now she's had to head back home because our, our little boy has got on to light her, so I'm about to drag her away, so we're all separate at the moment. But so, so I'm hoping you've all got a lot of questions, but uh, the first thing I want to say is that uh, when we booked you, you said that you'd be guaranteed the day off, but you were currently doing a project, and just wanted to find out what that is. Oh, right, Shall I stand there? And then you can stand wherever you Yes, if I stand in the middle to answer the questions, um, then everyone can see. Um, I'm currently working at a, a theatre called The Mill at Sonic, which literally is a mill, it's a converted mill. So I've been leaving my car, my car about a mile from the rehearsal room, putting on my Wellington, <laughs> wading into the building. I kid you not, water's like this. Luckily the rehearsal room's on the best floor. Upstairs rehearsing, no other profession would do this, would they? They'd let us end with the flu. So they've given me a couple of days off while they drained the building. Anyway, we've been rehearsing in our wellies and we're about to open a play called Absurd Person Singular, which is an Alan Acorn. And I play this absolute lush. Um, it's very funny, very sad. I love Acorn. I think he's a kind of uh, English equivalent of Chekhov. Very, very, very interesting playwright and very, very funny. I mean, it's terribly hard not to corpse. Doing this show, really. Okay, question two. Right, um, just putting you on the spot. That's fine. <laughs> uh, the one of the big projects at the moment, I think, is the big finish series. You've done one complete series in 2012, and then you've just recently recorded as that third and possibly a fourth series. How much of that have you got done? And more coming. I think we've got. I think we've completed the third, don't quote me on it. I think we've completed the third, that's ever so bright. What is that? Yeah. <laughs> 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 were you lighting me? Yes. You know what I want to do? Oh, I don't know, I don't know what I do. Um, I think we That was the first one that we did, uh, Destination Nerva. Oh, yes, That's the yes. very first uh, Tom Baker original story, along with uh, Louisa's uh, Lila. My, my favourite of that lot was Wrath of Icena by John Dorney. I don't know if anybody's heard it. I think he's a fantastic playwright. If you, or writer, if you see anything with John Dorney's name on it, it's going to be well worth this hunting. He's fantastic. I'm also going to be doing it. I directed Katie in a. That was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> in, a, in an audio. Um, they said to me last time, they said, be warned, last time she was in the studio. It's because she's nervous. She gets incredibly nervous. And um, she got to the studio at 10, they, they couldn't get her actually into the booth, into the recording booth for two and a half hours. <laughs> <laughs> she's there chatting, chatting, chatting away. So I'd been forewarned. So uh, we did a little coffee and a chat for about half an hour. And then... And then uh, I said, okay, right, everyone, we're going to start recording and started ferrying them through. And she went, oh, I've just got one question. I thought, oh, what am I going to do here? So she asked me the question, and I went, oh, I think we can sort that out. We're in there, can't we? And I was pushed her through the door. 
Uh, and we got underway and we finished about two or three hours early. The thing is, she's just scared of wiping. She is so talented, Katie. Unbelievably talented. You might be having her. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully having her down. In she's also bark. <laughs> <laughs> in July, on the 6th of July, which is the day before what would have been John Pertwee's 95th birthday, we've got a John Pertwee tribute and we're looking at two or three guests, one of which might be Katie Mammy, possibly also um, uh, either, either or, uh, Richard Franklin, who was Mike Yates, uh, John Levine, who's Sergeant Benton. Ideally, if we get enough people going and we get enough maybe dealers coming down, we can get all three and have a unit um, sort of thing. Um, reunion. We'll see what we can do. Do you have difficulty getting people coming this far? Well, as I say, you're the first person we've got out in five years. Oh, no, no. So uh, we, we've had two or three. We, we, did, we did book um, originally Camille Kaduri, um, who was Jack and Tyler's mum. You mean not first choice? Uh, no, no, for the. Not for the <laughs> <laughs> This year, hopefully. we've got a, this Tom Baker day, which we've got Louise for, who's our first choice for this event. The Eccleston one, who is our first choice, was Camille Kaduri, but she uh, basically is a family lady, she's got sons and uh, lives in London, and she doesn't like to do conventions that are too far away from home, so she's um, had to pull out. We are looking at someone else. And I say for the John Pertwee one in July, we've got uh, two or three names, and we're just waiting on availability. Because uh, Katie is still a working actress, she still does audio, she still does the occasional bit of TV, so and she might have work she's on. Also, she's going to the Edinburgh Festival this year, Susie yeah. Ben Halligan, and Susie Ben Halligan. Another guest we looked at for um, uh, February Eccleston tribute was Annette Badland, who played one of Mr. B. But she's in Chicago for a weekend, <laughs> which is apparently better off for the film. She's going to uh, EastEnders, hasn't she? Yeah, she's yeah. as well. And um, just, I've just done a short movie <coughs> with her called A Quiet Carriage. Yeah. And we really, we really like doing it. I, 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 um, we, we said when we, when we arrived for the read through, that we would normally have been cast in each other's parts. Uh, so then we were sort of playing, playing each other really. We're both delighted to have an opportunity to move out of our comfort zone. So it's a short movie called A Quiet Courage um, by Horn, Horn, Horny Productions. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I've always got that right. Don't Google that, you might get something you know about. Uh, thorny! <laughs> <laughs> So yes, have a look. Have a look. Um, it's just we just saw the uh, preview of it. You know the sort of we called it the red carpet. It wasn't. It was, we had that do uh, two weeks ago, and they're just about to start, start the short film festivals with it. So the, the big finish, so we're good producing a, a Tom Baker series every year uh, until he gets bored, basically. Okay. Um, <laughs> so 2012, they had uh, Louise as um, Leela in uh, a series of six. 2013, they had Mary Tam in a series of six. Um, 2014, released this week, uh, is the first of series three. And then 2015 is the uh, series four, which again, both star Louise. And I was hoping to try and get copies of uh, the first one called King of Sontar, which Big Finish released in January. And I kept pestering them every day oh. in the hope that they would get physical copies here for today. I didn't sort of. Yeah, I, I tried. They, they've got the. Um, it's, down, it's available to download already in January, but physical copies, I don't think even Big Finish have got them. Oh, right, yeah. So the way it says due for January, so I kept pestering them saying, is it going to be out before 19? Can you get me a few copies? He's also so, yeah. recording Sontar. I hope that's not a secret. <laughs> <laughs> not anymore. I think, I think season four, which is due out next uh, in 2015, is going to be the, the, the series with um, Adam Walsh, hopefully. If it, if it isn't, I'll There's a lovely Tom Baker uh, story. Can I do two actually? Yeah. When she was asked who her favourite actor was, she said Tom Baker. <laughs> 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 so, um, you know he used to be the voice of BT, oh, yes. and her, her current husband, the very esteemed Richard Dawkins, 
took great delight in ringing her up and leaving messages from him to her in Tom Bates. <laughs> <laughs> I will be late home for supper. <laughs> Building, who do the new series Lego build, or well, Lego equivalent knockoff figures, are looking at doing a, a series of classic figures, one of which they've put as possibly being Leela. So how, how you feel Leela about being Lego? Yeah, yes. <laughs> a Leela Lego figure. And one of the questions that someone asked me, how would you feel about being immortalised in Lego? <laughs> <laughs> You know, the bad hair day. <laughs> My mum put on top of the tree instead of the fair. <laughs> um, and then we brought out five little ones this last year, which are yeah, quite... One of the ones we've got on that there, so we've got uh, two of them. One of which we're giving away in uh, a quiz at three o'clock. Oh, there about. Um, I like uh, it. Quiz, 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 you can uh, take part for weeks. No, no, I'm asking the question. I'm going to show my ignorance. And the other one we're auctioning off for charity, which is Hooks for Henry. Um, for the food, uh, basically, whenever we, we charge money for events, whatever we get pays for the events, and anything we get gets donated to charity. So one of the things that can be auctioned uh, for charity, and that's perfectly a reason to sign it if you win it. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, BFI screening we went to this year, uh, last year, sorry, uh, in May. Um, did you enjoy it? I loved it. I mean, I love the whole event. I love seeing those, um, you know, I love seeing it on the big screen because it, it's, so, it's so sophisticated now, isn't it? The way, the way everything's made. And it really does stand up to scrutiny. Yeah, it was the British Film Institute have done a series of, um, look, because of the 50th anniversary, one, one every month they've done a, a big screening as if it, um, of a particular doctor's story. And um, we used to talk when? On my birthday, yeah. Oh, 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 they went to the one uh, for it was Robots of Death, which yeah. was, I don't know how many the tunes that which ones were shown. Do you know? I have no idea. I think I think they took some kind of poll in the Doctor Who magazine. Do you subscribe to the Doctor Who magazine? Yeah, yeah I think they did they they do did some kind poll. of poll yeah. about which ones they like best, so they listen to the fans, yeah. mainly. That's a night that was based on the Agatha Christie story, Robots of Death. Um, which used to be called Ten Little N Word. <laughs> I don't know how she got away with that. And then it was Ten Little Native Americans. <laughs> and now it's called Manila Nas, I think. Yeah, so the, the title of the play has changed and changed. But that's the play it was based on. I've just been offered Miss Marple to talk to Yes, for a, for a tour. I don't know if we come down this neck of the woods. No, um, stops Exeter. The, 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 the yeah. stops Exeter, yeah. is it? I should tell. So where's, where's your biggest theatre near here? It's, it's a Royal Plymouth. It's a Royal Plymouth. Is it Kenroy? Bill Kenroy? No, it's Patrick Kerr. K-E-A-R. Okay, the do get down here. But do they? Well, I have a work with him too. <laughs> Check it out. How big does it, how many does it seat? Do you know? I've lost two. Two thousand? Yeah. Really? Yeah. 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 My wife used to work there uh, on stage door, so she hopefully will be able to find out whether or not it's coming. This yeah. is a, what, what era is it? What era is it? 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 I'll look into that and see if I can find out. Now, speaking of uh, stories and how, how you choose your favourites, when we were choosing what to put on, we had a choice between Face of Evil and Horror of Fine Rock. Face of Evil disc didn't work, so the choice was made for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently, someone said that Horror of Fine Rock is your least favourite story. Is that the case? Yeah, yeah. Underworld, closely followed. <laughs> <laughs> um, more and more, I like it because there's been, there's been a, it's, it really seems to have resurfaced uh, over the last year the, with the fans' love of it. And also, I've got in contact again with um, Lucy, she, she doesn't call herself, and Annette, she used to call it, with the slap. <laughs> Which was a real slap. <laughs> she insisted on a real slap, but she said it made her cry. <laughs> so I did. Uh, we did it three times. We did it once on rehearsal where it was absolutely brilliant and she thought we were recording and we weren't <laughs> and we did it again and it wasn't quite so good oh. she she went home and worried about it 
I came in the next day and said to Paddy Russell, please, would you mind if we did that scene again? And Paddy Lesser <coughs> said, yes, fine. I, I mean, I can't see companies now remounting the next day because of, on an actress win. So you, what you actually got was the third, the third slap. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Which is your favourite story? Sunmakers. Oh. I was hoping you were going to say that. Sunmakers was shown in November and December 1977, which is when I was born. Oh. I was actually born the day that uh, episode two of the Sunmakers was shown. That doesn't make me feel It's alright, I've only spent two. Uh, <laughs> 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 it's closely followed by uh, talents, which, you know, everybody oh, yeah. talents of Wayne Child had a lot of money spent on it. That was the first non-Sylvester McCoy story that I saw. I became a fan in 1989, no, well, 1988, 89, and watched um, the series as Sylvester McCoy was in it. And for Christmas that year, I asked my family and friends to buy me anything Doctor Who related. And the first ever Doctor Who thing I got was the VHS copy of Times Mojang. So how old are you? I'm 36. No, then. Oh, there, back then, I was third. Uh, mm. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> the dummy game, the dummy is the one that's used to No, no, not at all. Um, nothing like yeah, that. Yeah, it was the giant rat. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, I've got a five year old, and my wife and my mother in law both say, Don't put Dr. Chirin for it, it's scary. But he loves it. <laughs> <laughs> he can put whatever you want on, as scary as it is, even the new ones with like, the, the peg dolls and the uh, science and we've been angels. He sits and happily watching it. Leaving angels. Yeah, he'll yeah. watch anything. Oh. Oh. Well, the thing is, then so in later life, yeah. it's really troubled you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he's got children, proper children's programs on for him, like you know, Batman and anything that's like, and he, he, he gets a bit scared of the monsters. Yeah. Well, he's got Doctor Who, which is meant to be a bit older, but he's not that away. Right. <laughs> Mark Gatiss was brought up on a on a diet of horror movies. Yeah, that's lovely. Many clubs. Fantastic brain. That you're so knowledgeable and writes. You're so obsessed with it, isn't it? Just one of the uh, uh, project that you've either completed, I think you've completed, because it's due out this month, is a, a DVD called uh, Who's Changing, which is um, a fan produced documentary um, about 50 years. And it was done originally funded by Kickstarter. Um, you know what that is, but it's um, a website where anyone that's got an idea can go on and promote it, and people can go on and put money towards it. And if they get enough money to produce it, it gets produced. There's a what's Chris? I think it's a oh, uh, who is that? Uh, Chris, one of our members, um, wanted to produce uh, his own graphic novel. So he put it on there, people paid money towards it, and once you've got enough money for it, it's now in production and it's going well. Yeah, yeah we launched a couple of weeks ago, just like that. You've officially launched. That's what fantastic. This... What's the novel about? Uh, well, it's a, it's a single issue comic book that I've said it's short story. It's a uh, sleep park orientated horror set in Victorian London. Mm. Um, it's about the Victorian Corp. It's quite great. I didn't know about but that. Yeah, but yeah, so. that, that's how that who's changing documentary yeah. that you've contributed to. Got, I did, got, um, in Tom's words. We, got, we were in a blizzard of requests from, well, I would say, end of July through to just after Christmas. I seemed to be, every other day I was doing like a podcast or an interview or a questionnaire or meeting someone or popping down to a local radio station just because of the, the high profile of the 50th. So I, I can't say specifically about, about that because I think it was probably within that. That's the DVD cover from Amazon. Oh yes, I remember. Yes. He was really lovely, really good stuff. Yeah, yeah. You, you can pre-order it from Amazon for just under nine quid, or we're going to have, um, whilst Louise is signing, we've got a written quiz for you to do, and the, the top three scores and win a copy of it. So I've missed it. It's not out yet, so uh, 27th of <coughs> January is out, so it's the day you've got your quiz sheets, and I'll let you know whether or not you've, uh, you've won. Um, just, just, just a touch funny. Um, I picked up, um, I did a little bit of you know, sort of research and work on, on my lunch breaks, and not my lunch breaks, um, and I found a quote on your website which I read out and was very happy with, but then a colleague read out and it, it read it slightly differently. 
So I was wondering if you can clarify how it was meant. It says, to every loyal Doctor Who fan out there, I can't thank you enough for your letters and compliments of support since the heady days of Leela, warrior of the 70. That job was just 14 months of my life three decades ago, and I'm still remembered here for it, thanks to you. That was nice to me, but he really has. That job was 14 months of my life three decades ago. <laughs> And then it was, it 
was fine, and I felt, you know, welcome, and I wasn't so embarrassed anymore. But that very initial thing was a bit. Cool. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Well, Stephen Moffat's bringing Gallifrey back into the new series. Is there any chance you want to see Lever back on the Get right <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm thrilled. <laughs> so BBC, I've, I've, I've been raped and murdered. I've died at Berry Berry. I've been drowned and murdered. Um, how else have they killed me? A <laughs> heart attack in EastEnders, that was off camera. So and then Gallifrey blew up, and I thought, well, that's it. Every character I've ever done is now dead. <laughs> I can't come back with any of them, but not Gallifrey's Oh, I'd love to. I'd love to come back. I mean, even if not as me, I would love a crack at that. I think, what do you think of Peter Carlton? What do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting what he's going to do. He's such a good actor. I'd love to work with him. So when people say, well, you know, which doctor do you want to work with? What? The, the current one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was there a question down here? Oh, I was going to say, Rebecca, what would you say the power was to unwelcome me then? Ah, uh, Tom. You know, with Tom and I have got such a history, and normally I kind of skirt around it, but seeing this is celebrating his 80s, it's rather difficult not to talk about him. He, I, you have to work from the point of view that I now I would say love him, actually. And I never thought I would, uh, that sentence would come out of my mouth. Because he was very, very difficult. He didn't want a companion. He wanted to travel in the TARDIS on his own. He absolutely adored Liz, as did everybody. So he was very sad when Liz left. Mm -hmm. So to replace Liz, to have a companion he didn't want, let alone one that was half naked and getting a lot of attention. <laughs> <laughs> It, he didn't like Leela, basically, and that, that overlapped into not liking me. And it was actually, at least that was my impression, and it was actually during Horror of Fang Rock, uh, where we were, we had to, because of strikes, we had to go and film up in Birmingham. So we were kind of rather thrown together as a family, because normally when you rehearse, you, you, you know, you go off home at the end of the day, but because we were there, we were socialising together as well. And uh, there was one scene where he walked up the stairs, cut to me, is it the monster coming up the stairs? What is it? I creep over to the door, taking out my knife, open the door, oh, thank goodness, it's the doctor. So that's the, that's the little scene. So he'd creep up the stairs, cut to me, he opened the door. Thereby cutting my stealthy walk across the thing, building of suspense knife coming out, opening the door, oh, it's the doctor, cut it. So I stopped the tape, which, I, you know, it's verboten, really, <laughs> to stop takes. So I stopped the tape. I said, uh, it's not quite what we rehearsed. I think I've got to cross the floor first before you open the door. So we reset it, da -da -da -da, creeps up the stairs, cut to me, he opens the door. Second time. <laughs> oh, uh, sorry, it's not what we rehearsed. So we reset it, I sit down, he creeps up the stairs, cuts me, opens the door. Sorry, that's not what we were at. I've got my heels in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was really out of character for me to behave this way. And I, and I, the fourth time I got my leg, crept over, opened the door, sorry. So the studio's a bit like this. And Tom's sitting underneath the set, underneath the spiral staircase. And I just went down, I went, Tom, I'm so, Sorry, but I think it was important for the story. It wasn't just my ego talking there. And he went, that's all right, love. <laughs> and from there on, we started to get on much better. And I wish, not brilliantly, but much, much better. And I wish I'd had the courage to do that in the first place. Because you weren't, he's, he wasn't bullying exactly. He just didn't want me there. And I was undermined at every available opportunity. But it takes two. You have, to be, you have to kind of receive that for it to be effective. If I'd only had the courage to just go, what are you, what's this, why are you behaving like this? Let's talk, what's wrong? I think we'd have had a much better relationship, much better on. And since then, he's apologized very publicly and very sincerely uh, and, and very humbly uh, in a very moving way. And, I, and so I feel very disloyal, in a way, telling you this story. 
because now I, he really will be somebody I would turn to, somebody I respect, somebody who makes me laugh, somebody who's intelligent and witty and talented and, and an absolute joy to work with. And I just wish it had been a bit more like that back in the day. I was say, um, Paddy Russell, in an interview, actually spoke about that and spoke how highly of you she felt for you challenging something on the floor. Did she, did yeah. she remember the incident? Yeah, because she, she, yeah, she spoke about it. It was in an interview once, and she said, but you stuck to your guns, and she really it's admired that. She was talking about the, doing the stuff with Cartier and live TV and, and, and all of that, and then she used this as a, an example. It's amazing. How extraordinary. Yeah. I didn't know she, she even registered it, yeah. to be honest. Because she took me to one side at the end of that, the, the end of that recording, and said, "Be very careful, because you're becoming a bit like Tom." <laughs> <laughs> so, she was funny director Paddy. She was um, immensely talented. She was the first female director at the BBC, and to a certain extent, had to emulate a male way of working in order to get where she got. She really did pave the way for a lot more women. Um, but Tom called her Sir the entire time. <laughs> but she always came in under budget and on time. Uh, and she was very regimented. We had, we had the staircases, you know, marked out on the floor. And I remember she made us, you know, any other director, you know, we just go, you go around and pretend you're on the set. She made us tread on each, absolute, every individual step as if we were climbing up the stairs because she had to get an exact timing so that she knew in the editing exactly where, how long it was going to take and all that kind of thing. So she, she a blessing in the house, but she certainly opened the door for lots more women, which is fantastic. Yes. Was there any outfit you did wear that you, wanted, that you said, I love that, I want to take it home? I quite like the Victorian underwear. <laughs> <laughs> I quite like the pantaloons. Um, what I wanted for um, Horror Fan Rock, you know, the polo neck and the, I wanted a huge grey, you know, for a big bloke, I wanted to wear something that would just, and you know, why have they conveniently got one that fits with the belt <laughs> and the, you know, it should have been so unbelievable. I, I noticed the boots as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't find that rock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what well, they're up to. <laughs> But the, the other boots, the, the ones that I wore most of the time, had a heel inside. It's quite clever. So I, they looked like they were flat boots, but actually they, they lived to be about three or four inches. So. I know, it's clever, isn't it? Yes, sir. I just noticed any, any particular change when Graham Williams came on board? Was it a different style? Or? Yeah, very different styles. Philip Hinchcliffe was very much... You know, Philip never, never put... Um, never put his coat, his arms through the sleeves of his coat. He'd always have his jacket round his shoulders. You know, that kind of slight, <laughs> Nathario slight. You know, kind of, just kind of slightly leaning on the doorway. You'd suddenly realise Philip had been standing there for 10 minutes watching. It was great. Always wore a cardigan. He had his hands in his room, like down, <laughs> down on the floor with us, you know, worrying about things. So Philip was very much a sort of um, boss. And Greg very much wanted to be one of the workers. In a way, if you could have amalgamated the two of them, you would have had the perfect producer. Because your brain was totally trustworthy, caring, empathetic, um, lovely. But you can't be the most popular man on the floor and be the producer. You just can't. You have to be just that little bit away. That, you have that little bit of authority and gravitas that, that lets you be an arbitrator, basically. Um, so yeah, there was a very big difference in style, I think. Yes? Apart from Tom, obviously, you know, who's your favourite doctor? Yeah. yeah. And I think a lot of, uh, I think a lot of um, responsibility was on his shoulders to make it work. You know, I, I love Patrick, yeah, love him. Trevor Baxter and Christopher Benjamin. They shouldn't be allowed, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> if you could bottle it and, and, and hand it over instead of anti-depression pills, you know, they're, they're the perfect team. They're, 
absolutely adorable. They're so rude to each other and they're so funny and they just adore each other. And um, I, it would have been lovely to have seen a television spin-off series of that, I think. They would be absolutely marvellous working, working with them. And Trevor, you know, he, can't, he, has, he has terrible problems with arthritis now. He can hardly move. He never complains, never. You, you just wouldn't, you know, I come in with a bit of a hangover or whatever, and it's like the whole world knows it, but he's fling in and out of that chair and just being so stoic and brilliant about it. Just marvellous, marvellous men. And because they're, it's going to sound old now, because they're classically trained, because they have that use of voice that, I, you know, I so respect and so try to emulate that, that ability to handle text in a way that kids aren't taught so much now at all. Um, it, it's, it's really lovely to sit on the back foot and learn from them. You know, they've been around a long time played so many roles. They, they're just marvellous to be. Yes? Do you know if you um, filmed with it with um, the Daleks? Do you know if you... Yeah, I never, when I got the job, I, two things I thought, oh, now I can afford to put up shelves. I wanted to put up shelves and I'm going to meet the Daleks, neither of which ever happened. <laughs> <coughs> Not till I got onto audio and then I met the Daleks. But, but no, I'd love to admit that. But back then, they're, they're more versatile now, but back then, you know, they, they couldn't move fast, they couldn't go up and down stairs. They had a very limited vocabulary. Writers didn't like them, although audiences absolutely adored them. But they're a bit more versatile now, aren't they? Flying and things. And different colours. Have you seen the pink one that does the convention? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Darling, Darling. I love it. Campus thing. <laughs> I wanted to ask a little about tracting with us at Christmas and how it came about. I'm sorry it's not that happy, but... Congratulations for getting the title right. It took me ages to, to learn it. Does anybody, did anyone see Track Tape Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's a ghost story that went out on Christmas Day. First job I've ever got via text. Mark texted me and just went, are you free? I wasn't actually, I had to extricate myself from another job and I went, I can be. <laughs> and he went, okay, well I want you to do such and such, so it's great. And then I assumed, my, because I had to play myself and then myself 20 years younger, and I assumed my daughter would be playing my younger self. And he went, no, 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 you can do it. Oh God, so I went on a diet immediately. Um, and uh, they were, they've got this, they've got this makeup now. <coughs> Excuse me. That's um, that's literally called wrinkle filler. <laughs> <laughs> and and you put it on like poly filler, and then scrape, <laughs> and then scrape a sort of scalpel thing across it. So you've got like a bit of a blank canvas going on, which is, you know, if it's lit properly, it looks fine. If you're out in sunlight, you look a bit like someone's got makeup. <laughs> <laughs> but also with CGI, they could. They could lift things and do double layer of lashes and all that and all that sort of thing. So I, I was helped a bit with the old computer technology. That was my first fear. Vanity, thy name is all that. Um, but I thought I, I I'm so ashamed to say I'd never heard of Mr. James before. Because everyone was oh yes, Mr. James ghost stories, la la la. And I, and I didn't didn't know them. So it's opened up a whole new world for me. And I didn't stick there. It was it was a bit like doing filming back in the 80s. It had all those values and fantastic makeup people. And, the, and I was slightly disconcerted that, you know, the, the, the 50s is, of course, now referred to as a period piece, which, of course, is my, absolutely my childhood. And there was one moment where we stepped onto the station um, to collect somebody off the train. And the steam train was going, and the signs were there, and everybody was dressed in 1950. And it was like, I, I felt a bit sad, I had a bit of a lump in the throat. It was so, it perfectly 50s. It was so what I remembered from my very, very young days, you know, holding my mother's hand. I, I just thought they did a marvellous job with it. I, I nice beautifully filmed. And what was it like being with Eleanor Brown? Being, oh, oh Eleanor Brown, what a treat to work with her. She's mad. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she, bought, she gave me a gift. It was a huge bag. I mean, really about this big. Of and a seagulls. Thanks. How lovely. <laughs> um, and and uh, 
she talked a lot about her time at, at university and you know how she got started and I don't know where her life is now. She bought a she bought a flat just off Regent's Park for something like twelve thousand pounds or something. <laughs> she's still there. It's just and she's lived a very simple life, but also this sort of rather glamorous, extraordinary life as well. And Una starts to work with her as was delightful as well. Well, I kept thinking of was the scarecrow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. And she, because she had uh, like a huge chunk to do in it, but of course they did it all in one day, all in one take. So she was so nervous that morning. She was like a skittery little girl. And why does it all have to be in one? And everything else was just close-ups, but the great long speech. You know, she played somebody who never, never, never stopped talking. So it's quite, quite a chunky thing to do. But love, I was so pleased to be part of it. And to be my very first job ever was. Um, Sided with Rosie, I only had four lines in it. Uh, and that went out on Christmas Day. So it's like a kind of, felt like a kind of full circle beginning of career and end of career. Not well, uh, winding down. <laughs> winding down. The character you played inside with Rosie was called Mary. Was she? And the character you played in Tractor Hill Off was called Mary. Mm -hmm. You're my, you're my new phone of friends. <laughs> <laughs> children by now. <laughs> Boys and girls. I think Andrew's long gone. <laughs> Do you know what I'd have liked? I'd have liked to have died saving the doctor's life. And then for him to have had to travel back in time to make that not happen. And then to have had to push me out of the TARDIS and say he didn't want to travel with me anymore in order to save my life, but for me to not understand why. To have a really sort of discordant ending mm -hmm. rather than that kind of, oh, actually I've fallen in love <laughs> with somebody I haven't spoken to. Is there any point about any role that you actually would like to play if you haven't got a I'd love a crack at Cleopatra. I'd love a go at Cleopatra. And um, there's a, a book called The Bone People, uh, which is a really um, heartwarming but very, very difficult story. And I, I think it would make the most brilliant film. So I'd, like to go at I'd like to do one major film before, before I finally have a stage role. That's a oh, on stage. Yeah, <coughs> definitely. Definitely. There's another question here. I haven't heard The Abandoned yet, but I assume you finished writing it. It was recorded a long time ago. Yes. Will there be more writing? How was it writing for yourself, Tom? Um, <coughs> it was very, it was very uh, exciting to write for me and Tom, to be honest. And actually, the, the story was very fan-inspired because I, I wanted to... Because imagination is everything, I think. It's your, it's your absolute best friend and it's your absolute worst enemy. Imagination is the thing that can get you that job on the other side of the world that you want so badly because you can imagine yourself there and you do everything in your power to get it. And the imagination can keep you locked in one room because you're so frightened of what's on the other side of the door. And I thought it would be very interesting to explore a story where the imagination was both the enemy and the savior of the piece, that how complicated that, that is. Because I hear over and over again how, how the fans have 
found their imagination is connected with Doctor Who like it has with no other program. And that that, 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 that that that's the kind of thread that runs through all of you and connects you all, and connects you with us and connects us with the program that goes out now. That that, that, that collective creative force is a very inspiring, very wonderful thing. And if it's harnessed and used properly, uh, can bring great joy. So that, that was the feeling, the underlying feeling. The actuality of that was quite difficult because it was my first story. I am writing more of them, yeah. My first story for them, I felt like I was at school and that I had all these teachers overlooking what I was doing. Again, a blessing and a curse because some of their advice was fantastic and some of them, I thought, stultified my creativity. But they, in their turn, were a bit bound by the BBC. They were only, they were only certain um, enemies I could use. But for example, I was allowed to mention the Horder, but I'm not allowed to mention the Sontarans. You know, the BBC have a kind of, I don't know why, hierarchy of monsters that we can call them, and ones that we can't. I suppose because ones they're going to develop for themselves in the future. So, we were, I just got ever so slightly locked in rather than uh, set free by it. But yeah, it was a wonderful experience and I'll, I won't have them breathing down my neck so much next time. So it'll be easier. And Stephanie Cole's in it, so I'm so thrilled because she plays this mad old lady and, 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 I, and I describe the, the plot to her and then I said, would you do it? She said, yes, darling. I'll, don't you want to see the script first? She said, you're in it. I need Tom Baker and I travel in the TARDIS. What more do I need? <laughs> <laughs> so I was very blessed to get, to get her on board. So. Yes? Did you ever realise that 37 years ago you'd be up here today talking about Dr. Who? No, I know. It's, I have to pinch myself sometimes. Is it 37? It's 37 years, 1977. That's I was done when I was two. <laughs> um, yeah, January the 1st. January. Yeah. No, I didn't. And isn't it marvellous? And thank you for having me. <laughs> did you watch Doctor Who? Because I started watching it in 1963. Yeah. And we had the same, we were the same year. So did you watch Doctor Who when you were a kid? Yeah, I remember the first one. I do. And we were never allowed to eat in our living room. My mum had decided that this weird and wacky program was going to be a family treat. <laughs> so we had tea put on the trolley and the trolley was wheeled into the, into the lounge and we all sat down and had our babies on toast while Doctor Who was on. And it, was, it just became a big, big family event way back then. Hi, did you red-headed feistiness ever come out? Pardon? Set? Did you red-headed feistiness ever come out on set? Do you ever lose the plot? Do you mean, do I, do I ever lose my temper? No. no. <laughs> I don't, very, very, very rarely, but when I do, boy, I know. But people pay attention. I remember, I just, I remember one incident, in, I was at the Royal Shakespeare Company, and I'd been given some absolutely fabulous costumes, and then they gave me this horrible, horrible costume for the finale scene. So wrong for the character, just to... It was a sort of, it really was the designer squeezing you into his concept rather than him enhancing the story with what he, and I, I just remember standing on the stage going, I am not wearing this costume. <laughs> <laughs> All the place going completely quiet and the director going, no, I don't think it's quite right. <laughs> if I had said it quietly, I'd have probably got my own way anyway. <laughs> Any more questions? Two questions that uh, were emailed that I haven't asked yet. Um, Connor uh, from Hartley, who's eight, says, in Doctor Who, you help the Doctor look after Kana. Do you have a dog? I do have a dog. <laughs> I have a dog called Marley, as in Bob Marley, um, who's very, very old now. And he's a nightmare, was a nightmare. He was four years old when we got him, rescue dog. And he, um, I think he was trained as a fighter or something. We have terrible problems in Kent with illegal dog fights, you know, they dig pits and throw them in, it's awful. So taking him out for a walk was like going into a war zone. <laughs> I've never let him off the lead, responsible dog owner, um, uh, but he needs a lot of exercise, so 
you know, couldn't never just get him out there and throw a ball for him, really had to walk and walk and walk and walk. He's and he would escape. I should have called him Houdini, really, because he just escapes at every available opportunity. Um, so he has to go on a tether in the garden as well. Um, so he, we've had a long and complicated relationship, me and Marley. Of course, I got it from my kids who now left home. Yes, Mum will take him with us. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but he's still, he's now 17, and much, much more better and really rather gorgeous and, you know, I adore him. What breed is he? He's a staff collie mix. He looks like a very big Jack Russell with a jaw, you know, he's got that lock jaw that those dogs have. I wanted the little collie bitch in the next, the yes. next the, you know, the rescue yeah. house, a little seven-week-old, beautiful Welsh Border Collie, but my kids were, ah, that's the one we want, because we thought it was a bit, you know. And then who gets left looking after it? Yeah. Hey, that's what mums are for, isn't it? You basically lead us out, but you basically lead us character out beyond the dog. Oh, my dog. then dog. Yes, I had a, I had a Basenji back then, a Basenji Whippet Terrier. Basenji is the um, Egyptian dog that has huge ears that doesn't really have a proper bark, but they're amazingly alert and, you know, that, that kind of head cocking body language. Then. So to, to show, when, 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 you, when you just hold out the knife, yeah. the alien-ness of it, oh. you know, when you, in, in, in Van Rock you were shoveling the shovel, you were doing it in, a, in an alien way. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you these, little, these little things that you were doing, you were just setting you apart. Thank you. The detail, the detail. Yeah. I had a lot of help from Terry Walsh, do yeah. you know what I mean? Yes, Terry Walsh. He did a lot of body language stuff with me before I before I went on set. Yeah, He's our head stunt man. It was great, you know, because every time you had a fight and you just kind of get hold get hold of his hand and do like a swim, you know, just like you're being strong, and he hurled himself across the rehearsal room like I thought I did that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do it at all. It was just <coughs> there was a gentleman here. Uh, jelly babies. Oh, yeah. Uh, and we lost track of the amount of time you've been on for a while. Yeah. I have. And the very first signing I ever did, I actually got quite ill because, I, <laughs> <laughs> because there was a row of people bringing their kids. It's very much more, far more adults watch it now than back then. So at the, at the, at the first convention, everybody brought their kid, and every child had the, and I'm sitting with Tom. Every child had a bag of jelly babies, and they'd wait till you ate one. <laughs> I don't know how many we signed for like four hours. I don't know how many jelly babies I ate. Sometimes I'm very grateful for them. You know, at four o'clock you start to sag a bit. Little sugar burst. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, with the DVD age came the DVD commentary. Is it very easy to watch and comment on your own work? Do you know it's marvelously helpful when you've got somebody like Toby Haydoke. Uh, do, do you know Toby? Yeah. yeah. If ever you get the chance to see his shows, he's, and he loves the program so much. Um, when he's there, if it gets slightly uh, sticky, he'll just prompt with a question. If you listen, he's so skillful when he decides to interrupt and when he doesn't. Sometimes the people who are commentating want to show off how much they know, which mm. is fine, but it you, it means you can't offer your lair quite so well. But Toby really supports it. I would find it quite hard without without somebody prompting. Also, you're in quite a difficult position, aren't you? Because do you sit there going, oh, this is when I did this, and this is when I did that, and it's a bit, the whole, whole thing sounds like you're just simply showing off. But in actual fact, people want to hear the odd anecdote, so it's a, it's a kind of skill to get in mm. there without without feeling like you blow your own trumpet through the whole thing. Mm. One of the things we're looking at for this year is to get Toby down to Plymouth to do both of his shows. Um, he's got two Doctor Who based comedy shows that he normally does in arts theatres. We went to see him in Dartmouth, Dartmouth a few years ago, and we're lucky to book him to come down for an afternoon or an evening to Plymouth and do both of his shows back to back uh, for Plymouth Hope. So, the first one's called Not Set My Doctor Who Star, which is a brilliant title. And then my stepson stole my sonic screwdriver. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, we can talk about how we can come down and do both. 
his stepson is um, profoundly deaf. And uh, his mother sings. And I had his mother and a friend of mine uh, singing in concert. I run a little fringe venue at my local pub once a month to try and bring something interesting there. I've had to take me um, And uh, Nathan came and he, he watched his mum sing. And then he went back to his whatever little computer game he was playing, got near her. And my other friend went home that night and had to pull over because this song came into her head and the song was uh, What Do You Hear When I Sing? And the next time I saw Helen in concert, she said that she'd written this song. She thinks it's the best song she's ever written. Unfortunately, she can't sing it because it has to be for Nathan's mum. She called Nathan's mum up. And I thought, oh no, she hasn't explained that, that Nathan's profoundly deaf. Anyway, Catherine started singing this What Do You Hear When I Sing? And it was very sweet and very lovely. And then halfway through, she started to sign it while she signed it. And it was the most moving thing. It was really extraordinary. And the song is, I don't know if you ever uh, want to Google it. I think, I think it's up there on YouTube somewhere. Um, it, it, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful song. And um, the Deaf Association asked her to sing it and Nathan to sign it. So they perform it together now. It's a really lovely story. Sorry, nothing to do with Dr. Mm. Except, of course, that Nathan's besotted with Dr. Who. <laughs> <laughs> he has a sonic screwdriver. He did steal the sonic screwdriver. <laughs> <coughs> Any more questions from the floor? Yes. What was it like meeting the dad fans for the first time? The what? The dad fans. The dad fans? Yeah. Well, I'm now meeting the grandpa. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> um, flattering. You know, what can I say? And, it, and of course, uh, te teenagers who were teenagers in the 70s now say, oh, you know, you sort of rather blushingly <laughs> ask me to sign me. Yes, I helped many a young man through a difficult place. <laughs> 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 yeah. Last night you tweeted um, that you were on your way to Plymouth in the morning and your son Harry so you basically go bomb. Yes. And someone, uh, Pond Girl 27, uh, sent me a PM, a direct message, saying, can you ask her if he's single? Oh, <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> my son. Is he a personal trainer? Yeah, like they it? both are. Yeah. Uh, the youngest one's married. In fact, the baby's due any second. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, um, He doesn't live with anyone, but he's a little bit in love. But he's very, I have to say to my girlfriend's leaving alone. My girlfriend's leaving alone. And then the next generation. When's the date due? It's actually due uh, week after next, but they think the dates are all over here, so it's going to be any time now. Heads again, Is that going to make you feel older? No, I've been, oh, I've been on them for a decade <laughs> to give me a grandchild. I have a step grandson already. So. Hudson Tiger. It's a great name, isn't it? Hudson Tiger. <laughs> So my mother in law is 45 and she's a grandmother and she's a hell of a lot of women. Get the last one out for me. Does she know this is a No. Uh, um, any more questions from the floor or should we start the quiz? Start the quiz. Uh, that's that's it, Paul. Yeah, go on. What's it like meeting the fans dressed as you? Do you know, I, I, the last. Convention, last but one convention I went to, and there were two girls there dressed as Leela, one in each of the, one in the little tennis dress outfit, one in the, and they were both stunning, I mean really stunning, beautiful girls. And I absolutely loved it, and there was a bit of me going. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a kind of bereavement saying goodbye to your youth beauty in that way. It's it's gone. I had it. It was lovely. It was terrific. And I think you just got to embrace Act Three um, with as much generosity of spirit and wisdom that you gave to those who did and go with it. So basically I love it. But I would be lying if I didn't say there was a bit of me that wants to do that. <laughs>